That wasn't in self-appreciation. I was actually setting something up for the recording. Uh, what we're doing here is Under the Cross. Under the Cross is a brand new uh, podcast uh, series project from Higher Things that's going to be running head on at mental health issues. Uh, I'm really, really excited about this project. These, uh, these episodes are going to start releasing in January uh, of this next year. I'm really, really excited about this because it actually lets us start to address not only the enormous herd of elephants in the room that is mental health that is becoming more and more apparent, um, but it also lets us attack it uh, in light of all of the ways that God would have us deal with us as creation, body, soul, and mind. Uh, I'm Pastor Goodman, uh, so I do Jesus stuff. Uh, but I'm really, really excited to be, be joined here by Ashley, who's a, a therapist, who actually gets to start to talk about uh, things from the, the mental health side. Uh, because in the same way that if you broke your arm, you know that you're not just supposed to pray it better, but you, you go to a doctor. In the same way, God would also have people in your life to care for your mind. Uh, these are not at war with one another, but they're actually knit together for good. And so in the same way that if you broke your arm, you should maybe do both, pray and go to the doctor to struggle with a number of mental illnesses, uh, anxiety, depression, self-harm, eating disorders, all the things we're going to be talking about in these series. There are people to help you. And so we're going to be tackling some of these issues. And like Pastor said, my name is Ashley. I am a therapist here in Colorado. Um, disclaimer, um, I am a therapist, I'm a mental health professional and an addiction specialist, um, and I'm not your therapist. Um, so I'm not providing therapy. I'm not doing a big group session. That's very legal. Um, and so I'm just here to, um, kind of be the expert on this, um, topic. And I just want to put that disclaimer out there for everybody. Um, we'll have kind of some time later throughout this week, um, to talk about, you know, going about that, getting your own therapist, what that looks like. Um, but I'm just putting that disclaimer out that this is not therapy. Um, and we're here to talk about this hard stuff. Um, and today's topic, um, is addiction. And I thought we would just get right into it. Um, and not, uh, beat around the bush with this topic. Um, and addiction, most people, I think usually think about it in terms of drugs or alcohol, right? An addict. Um, and it, is much deeper and much bigger than that um, in terms of kind of the broad scope of what addiction can look like. Essentially, um, anything to an extent can be an addiction, can be something that's causing an issue in your life. Um, that's kind of what we classify an addiction as anything that really impacts your role, right? Impacts a, a function in your life to where it's, it's not allowing you to fulfill that role, um, right? So if you are not able to be a student, not able to be a parent, not able to be a friend, whatever that looks like, um, that it can, can be um, a function of addiction. And it disrupts your life and, and causes all kinds of things to go wrong. Um, so that's kind of the start of where we're going today is in the topic of addiction. Um, and the thing that I do want to mention about addiction is um, there is science to it. Right. It's not that a person it has a moral failing because they have an addiction or can't stop using or doing something. Um, there's there's actually a difference in your brain. Right. So there's a part in, in your brain that lights up um, and that doesn't light up in other people. Um, and so it scientifically makes things more difficult. It's not just a choice that somebody makes or doesn't make. Um, and that's not really something to be debated. It's not something. Um, you know, that people will say, oh, no, that's not true. It's, it's a fact that's been proven. And so I just want people to kind of start out with that and say, it, you know, it's not just, again, a moral failing. It's something that can be proven and we can look at and say, this is different. That actually fits, though, with what we believe as Lutherans. And this is one of those places where, again, we can see how things are supposed to be. Uh, holistic sounds hokey. But God actually puts people in your life to address these things. Uh, we don't believe that a sin is making bad choices. We don't believe that sin is doing naughty things. Sin is a condition. And it has symptoms. But in the same way, if I, again, physically were ill, if I had lung cancer, I might have a cough. But if I took cough medicine, you wouldn't say I'm all better now. There, there's something deeper going on here. The, the, the ways that we talk about addiction, uh, it, it's, it's not simply a, 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 like, I love that. It's not simply a moral failing. It's a condition that needs to be addressed. But in the same way, Christianity is not given so that you can stop having moral failings. It's given so that you can have forgiveness of sins. It's, it's given so that you can have peace in something outside of yourself. 
Absolutely. And I think when it comes to kind of accepting that, that's the biggest thing for a lot of people is that there's all the stigma, right, around mental health and addiction and substance use and that whole world, right? Even just saying like, oh, I have a problem with this. It it comes with something, right? Like people feel ashamed to talk about it, can feel ashamed to even bring it up to themselves, right? Think about, hey, am I doing this too much? Is this an issue? Um, and I think that, that's really the first step, right, is, is accepting it and saying, hey, you know, just, just like pastor was talking about, if you have a broken arm, you're not just going to hope it gets better, right? Like it's, it's going to heal wrong and it's not going to go great and it's not going to feel good. And so if you don't address the issue, um, it's not going to get resolved. And it's the same thing with mental health and addiction. Um, and in my experience, I don't know that I've really ever seen a situation where there's an addiction issue and there's not an underlying either mental health symptom or issue or trauma, um, and so again, it's not just, Hey, I, I just, you know, I like to do this or, you know, I just can't stop doing this drug or whatever it is. Um, there's, there's things underlying it. Um, and, and that's oftentimes what people are also afraid sometimes and worried to address. Right. Cause that's actually confronting head on, like in our language, it's old Adam. It's, it's the thing inside of you that every day is racing toward the grave, not just dying. And sometimes sin uh, is, is more apparent because it, it's witnessed by other people. But every time, sin breaks stuff. And sometimes that's the sin that you do, either to yourself or others, but sometimes that's the sin that's done against you, that sort of sets you off on a path that no longer points true north. Um, it, it's sort of actually like, Playing, you guys play that that dizzy wiffle ball game. It's it's fun because you run into things and fall down, and that's how I am normally when I play sports. And so it's it's nice for me because it levels the playing field a little bit. Um, if you're all dizzy and somebody points you in the wrong direction, you're gonna go in the wrong direction, and that shouldn't surprise anyone. Trauma, it, it it's something that we experience that breaks something. It's sin that does real damage and sets us on a course that is not true north anymore. And the problem is, it feels that way. It still feels right. But it's, well, our, our thoughts, our, our emotions, we, we're broken by sin. And so God puts people in our lives to address this, both mentally, both spiritually, and, and, and also physically sometimes too. Um, it, it lets us talk about this, uh, again, in a way that addresses the fact that all of you are addicts. Every sinner is some kind of addict or another, all of us. Some people have gotten caught, and that's uncomfortable. Some people have addictions to things that are more stigmatized, like, for example, heroin, bad choice. But um, heroin isn't somebody who just made bad choices. It, it's a lot of things that have gone wrong. Uh, but there's also the private sins. Because I've talked to drug addicts in the short time that I've done this, and some of them could admit they were addicts, and some weren't there yet. And in the same way, um, the statistics don't end at the beginning of the church building. When you walk in, there are still those of you in this room who are struggling with pornography, who are struggling with same-sex attraction, who are struggling with alcohol, who are struggling with substance abuse, who are struggling with any manifestation of an inward disease that we call sin. See, it's a fancy church word that's easy to spell, and I like it because it's easy to spell. Uh, but it really just capsulizes all of those things that are, are wrong, uh, that, that, that break stuff. Um, people can be addicted to power, to technology, to money. We call it idolatry. You see where it starts to come. And so to talk about addiction, that isn't to find a group of people to look down upon, or even to say, really need our help as Christians. But it's to, to begin to start to say that they're sinners who need help. Because it, at least where we're, I do this stuff. Every addict I have ever, ever talked to has had two things in common. First, they were sinners. And second, they're hurting so much under the weights of what they're going through that they're dying for a quick fix to the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly it, is that, you know, when you talk about addiction, whether it's staying on your phone for six hours at a time or drugs or alcohol or video games or whatever it is, um, it does the job, right? People do drugs. And then if it didn't help, if it didn't work, they would say, okay, 
this didn't go well, I'm going to do something different, right? But the thing about drugs and alcohol and other addictions is that they work, right? They work in the moment, they get the job done, they help you feel better for the next five minutes. But it's about the long term consequences, right? And the consequences after the fact and how, like I said, it's impacting your life, how it's impacting your family. Um, when we talk about addiction, and specifically mental health as well, um, it's not an individual disease. It's not an individual thing that one person struggles with and then they're the one that has to get help and they're the one that has to do all this stuff, right? It really is a, a family and a community disease. Um, and then it impacts families, it impacts relationships, it impacts kids, it impacts communities, right? On a larger scale, you know, it impacts the infrastructure, it impacts the economy, all those things, right? And that it really... Um, you know, that's why we're working, I specifically am working to kind of destigmatize it is that um, the statistics don't lie, right? Like Pastor said, um, I think the statistics are like one in five, one in six people at the minimum know somebody that's struggling with addiction in some way, shape, way, shape or form. Um, Which really or, only means that like four out of five are really good at hiding it. Yeah, exactly. And and that's the thing with these statistics is that not everybody is going to offer up. Yeah, I struggle with addiction. Yeah, I did heroin. Yeah, I did coke, whatever. Right. Um, and so that's just the statistics that we know. Um, and so that's the thing I think that is, I'm, I hope is helpful is that the more that we can talk about it, right? The more that we open it up and say, hey, listen, this is a thing that exists. It's not going to get better. Nobody's going to get help by ignoring it and not talking about it. Um, and so I think bringing in all of you guys, making, um, you know, this generation open to talking about these hard things is so important. Right. And I think this is actually where the church really struggles with it. It's not that it's science and we hate science. That's that's a false flag. And it's it's not that it, it's that uh, we actually believe that we defy statistics as the church. That's that's ridiculous. It, it's that it's that we're personally wrapped up in it. It's that these numbers are not just numbers. This is not just math. This is us. Um, if you want scripture for it, Romans chapter seven is the tale of every single addict. I do not understand my own actions, for I do what I do not want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good, so it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. This is your faith. This is our faith. This is our losing struggle. The idea that you can make good choices out of addiction and just quit is sort of like saying I can make good choices and stop being a sinner. I can make good choices and just not chase those websites, not chase that bottle, not chase that high. It's always the lie that we tell ourselves as addicts that there is a genuine and right quick fix for our pain. And addiction is nothing other than false optimism for that quick fix, that chance to win the war that we're all fighting inwardly. We don't like losing it every day. We don't like waking up knowing what's coming. I've seen the addicts in the middle of the high who think everything's right while they lay in the gutter but I've seen them afterwards knowing that they've wrecked their lives and hating themselves for it. Sooner or later, we get to actually confess as the church that talks about this, bringing in the statistics, bringing in the science. It's not an attempt to fix the problem any more than the high is an attempt to fix the problem. The addict spends more and more time chasing a lower and lower high. But as desperate as we are, we can't escape the weight of the sin that weighs on us. And so as we deal with this, we don't have to deal with it wholly and completely under the law. Paul throws his hands up at the end of this thing, and he says, Who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Christ Jesus our Lord. The point of this is to actually start to look at yourself as something other than the sum of your own actions and mistakes and sin, but somebody for whom Jesus has bled, somebody who Jesus has already redeemed. And I think when it comes to addressing it, right, addressing it, talking about it, um, you know, there's there's been the stigma, or maybe you guys have heard of the stigma that, um, you know, you're supposed to help yourself, right? You're supposed to pray, you're supposed to go to your pastor, you're supposed to just figure it out yourself. Um, and 
I can tell you that that isn't accurate, right? Is that we, we live in a world where we're around people. Um, there's kind of a quote that says addiction is the opposite of connection. So it's not, not doing these things. It's not, not, you know, um, just wanting to get high, wanting to do all this stuff, right? It's that there's something missing, right? That there's this missing connection, whether it's feeling connected to, you know, a family, a larger community, whatever that looks like, um, is that there's something missing and, you know, kind of the cl cliche of wanting to fill a gap, wanting to kind of fill a hole, um, in, in you and what's going on with you. And I've heard a lot of people talk about it in that way. Um, and that it's not meant for you to seek help just on your own, right? Because we're so, we're so biased within ourselves is that our, our brains can convince ourselves of anything. We can justify anything. We can give ourselves excuses and justifications and say, Oh, I'll be fine. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll, I'll, you know, when I get to this point, I'll get help, right? When I start drinking in the morning, I'll get help. Um, and that can be a really slippery slope. And the church sees it too. And it wants to help. We see you hurting. We know because more often than not, we're struggling too. I'm an addict. Every day I do the same stupid sin. Every day I struggle and I fail. And it makes it all the harder for me to stand here and say, thou shalt not. We lean on the grace of Jesus. But the thing that we try to do sometimes as the church that doesn't help is we just try and trade one high for another. And so we'll, we'll get them high on Jesus instead. And we'll try and make your religion your new emotional gratification. Um, if, if you just really, really fall in love with the Lord, there will be no more vacuum inside of you. And this is a theology of false glory that is every bit rooted in the same pitfalls of addiction as heroin, because I can find, and I think all of you can too, a handful of burnt out ex-Christians who bought into the idea that praying to Jesus and just really giving them their heart would be the quick fix to them never actually feeling that pain or that sadness or that burden again. You see in all of it, we're, we're chasing the same thing. How can I hop over the condition that is old Adam, the condition that is sin? And instead, we're supposed to be addressing it. Absolutely. And, and the thing about kind of finding a therapist, having a therapist, um, is that it's, it's supposed to be your own journey, right? Is that it's supposed to be your own, um, you know, time for you to have this person that's a third party that is bound by confidentiality. That's not going to go gossip, go tell your stuff. Right. And for, for you to be able to just share what's on your mind. Right. And I think a lot of the times, um, in certain situations, there's, there's not a lot of opportunity to have that unbiased opinion, right. To like spill all your stuff and say, here's, here's all my trauma. Here's all my stuff. Um, and not be given advice, right. Not be given like, Hey, this is what I think you should do. Um, and there's a, a picture kind of explaining therapy and how, you know, one part of it that's helpful um, is that if you think of, you know, the client, the person receiving therapy and a thought bubble and like a big ball of yarn, right, all twisted up um, and in talking and sharing and expressing their feelings, the therapist helps just kind of unwind them, right? So I'm not doing magic. I don't have all these answers, um, you know, for every single situation in your life. I might not even have an opinion or, you know, advice to give, right? Um, but a lot of the times, just getting it out there and and speaking about what you're going through is really powerful and healing.